Well, you can join me in opening your Bibles to Leviticus. In the Bibles around the room under the seats, you can grab one of those if you don't have one. Leviticus 8 is on page 86. Uh, Leviticus, um, as we've noted before, is difficult uh, to read, um, but we are seeing in this series that it's part of a big story. It points backward in history and in the Bible to Eden, this perfect world that God made, and forward to Jesus and His people and ultimately a new creation to come. So God set up the system in Leviticus as a symbol-laden echo of what humanity once had in Eden. And it also pointed forward to how Jesus would restore that life that we lost in Eden, but make it even better. So the Bible is a story from Eden to a new and better Eden from creation to new creation. And Leviticus, then, is not just about random rules. It's about solving the problem that we have faced as humans from very close to the beginning, the problem of being separated from God and the life that we lost in Eden due to our sin. And so, our text this morning is Leviticus chapters 8 and 9, and this is all about priesthood. One of the ways the New Testament presents Jesus is as our high priest. Hebrews calls him our faithful, merciful, great high priest. A priest is a mediator or a go-between. So, our fundamental problem is that we are sinners who are rightly separated from a holy God. And so, the question that Leviticus is written to answer is, how can we get back to Him? How will heaven and earth merge again like they once were? In Eden? How will God dwell among sinful people that not only are impure and sinful and therefore need forgiveness and uh, spiritual cleansing for Him to be with us, but we need new hearts to even want Him to be with us? Well, the answer is through someone who can bridge the gap. That's what a priest does. Jesus is the high priest who restores humanity to God. But we're not looking at the New Testament today, which unfolds the priesthood of Jesus. We're looking at the Old Testament book of Leviticus, which foreshadows the priesthood of Jesus. So Leviticus 8 and 9 introduce us to the high priest in Israel. This story is a big moment in the history of Israel. It may not seem like it if you're kind of just reading through the book of Leviticus, wondering whether you're going to ditch your read through the Bible plan in this moment or not. Um, But this is a massive moment in Israel's history. And because it's a significant moment in Israel's story, it's actually a really significant moment in human history and our story. So the tabernacle, this tent of God's dwelling is set up. God has instructed Israel about various offerings and sacrifices to restore us to God and be able to dwell in His presence, for Him to dwell with us. But those are not yet in action. We've heard the instructions in the first seven chapters, uh, but they haven't actually been done yet. The goal of this whole tabernacle being set up is for God to dwell with His people again. But so far, the tabernacle's there. No one can get in. No offerings have been done. And it can't be done until a priest is installed. So, our text tells the story of how the priests, especially the high priest, uh, the priests were installed and these offerings began. So, here's the point of Leviticus 8 and 9, and then we'll read through it as we go this morning. God installs His priest to restore His people to His presence. That's the point. God is installing His priest, the high priest, to restore His people to His presence. And this all points forward to Jesus as everything in Leviticus does, not in weird speculative ways. So, beware of Googling how Leviticus points to Jesus. Some's good, some really weird. Um, But it all points forward to Jesus because the Father installed Jesus as our true high priest to restore us to His presence. God restores the life we lost in Eden and makes it better through Jesus, our priest. So, chapter 9 is God, God prepares His priests to serve, or chapter 8 is God prepares His priests to serve, and then chapter 9, God makes His glory appear. 
So first, God prepares His priest to serve, chapter 8. This chapter has seven major sections in it, and it was intentionally written that way. Each of these seven sections ends by noting, and it's usually by paragraph breaks in your Bible, you can look to the end of them. Each section ends by noting that Moses did what God commanded. So God has spoken, Moses does it, and this happens seven times. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, what does the number seven remind you of? The very beginning, Genesis chapter 1, creation is portrayed as being made over the course of seven days. Throughout the Old Testament, the number seven is used to evoke creation, that creation account. So Moses, who wrote that text by the guidance of the Spirit, it's inspired by God, uh, he would sometimes also structure other stories in these later texts with seven parts to make this connection. So what's going on here? Well, Moses did, uh, did this seven structure uh, already several times. He did this with the account of the building of the tabernacle in Exodus. The tabernacle was viewed, we've seen, as a new Eden, and this portable, mini, symbol-laden, Edenic world, and a new creation. And so Moses recorded God's instructions for the tabernacle over the course of seven speeches of God in Exodus. And then Moses built the tabernacle in seven acts. And then in Leviticus, the offerings we've seen in previous weeks in chapters 1 through 7 were given over the course of seven speeches of God. And then now Leviticus 8 shows that God's preparing the priests to serve in seven steps. And we'll see this whole process is preparing them to uh, take seven days for the preparation period. So the sevens, this isn't weird kind of biblical numerology. Again, don't Google numbers in the Bible. Going to get some good things, going to get some weird things. Um, seven's a big one, though, really intentional. Um, it's connecting it with the creation week on purpose because everything about the tabernacle and the priests is connected to the creation story. It's connected to Eden and life before sin entered the world because this is a little symbol-laden, temporary, partial reenactment. Um, and the presence of God, truly, among God's people. So it's not just interesting for people who like to study details. This is at the heart of what the text is about, which is why I'm drawing our attention to it. This is how we ultimately see how this connects to our lives today. Because when we see how this text connects back to Eden, we see how this ties to the whole story of humanity that you and I are a part of, the story we're still a part of. And it points forward to Jesus and how he came to restore the life you and I long for, so let's walk through each of the seven steps in this ordination of the priests. So first, the assembly. This is verses one through four. So we'll just read these seven sections as we go, and I'll give comments as we go. So this is verses one through four. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, take Aaron and his sons with him and the garments and the anointing oil and the bull of the sin offering and the two rams and the basket of unleavened bread and assemble all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and the congregation was assembled at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So Moses is gathering everything needed for this big, central, critical moment. He gathers the priests together. He gathers the materials to clothe the priests, the oil for anointing them and anointing the tabernacle and the things in it. He gathers the animals for the offerings that will be given. And he gathers the people, the whole congregations there. Um, and that word congregation can either refer to all of Israel or just the kind of representative leaders of Israel. So they're there because this is a public event that matters in the life of Israel's history. So they're gathered at the entrance to the tabernacle. They're gathered here at the entrance to this little mini inbreaking of a new creation in the world, evoking, evoking the perfect world in the beginning. No one's gone in yet, but they're outside. And now God has Moses not only set up the tabernacle that's standing before them, and then at the end of, the, end of Exodus, God filled the tabernacle with his glory and his presence, but then not even Moses could go in. So no one's allowed in yet. It's a picture of Eden, but the gate, the entrance to the east, like the entrance at Eden to the east, is blocked, guarded, closed off. So how will people get back in? And the answer is the priesthood. The priest will be dressed up and anointed as a new Adam and Eve, so that when they go in, they represent God's people, and they dramatically reenact humanity going back into God's 
presence. They'll be able to re-enter. And so the first step is this assembly, gathering everyone ready or together for this moment or this time. The second step is the clothing. This begins in verse 5. Moses said to the congregation, this is the thing the Lord has commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. And he put the coat on them, on him. And he tied the sash around his waist, Aaron's waist, and clothed him with the robe and put the ephod on him and tied the skillfully woven band of the ephod around him, binding it to him with the band. And he placed the breastpiece beast on him. And in the breastpiece, he put the urim and the thummim. And he set the turban on his head. And on the turban in front, he set the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord commanded Moses. So Moses Wash the priest to picture this cleansing. They're being cleansed, not just of dirt, but this picture of spiritual cleansing to be pure in God's presence. And then he clothes them. We can read more about the details of the clothing in Exodus 28. Um, this is the point of this text isn't to give all the details, but to actually have this happen now. And so one of the things emphasized in Exodus 28, though, is that the clothes, the clothes are for glory and beauty. So these priests are being beautified to look glorious. So here's a picture of what the clothing probably looked like. You can see the colors, a lot of blue, purple, scarlet, gold even woven in. Those are all rare and costly. They're viewed as beautiful, expensive, royal colors. These are the same colors that the tabernacle is made of. So the priest's clothing matched the tabernacle itself. It's like tabernacle camo. The hem of the robe is made of golden bells and golden pomegranates rotating. The purpose of the bells is perhaps to hear the priest when he's serving in the tabernacles. Because you can't go in there, you can't see in there, but you know he's doing stuff. And of course, if the bells stop and you call his name... That means it didn't go well for him, which you, of course, never want to happen. So there's some traditions here, it's not in the Bible, that maybe they, you know, tied a, a rope around his leg or something, because if he's struck dead in there, you don't want to go in there um, and pull him out unless something happens, so you've got to pull him out. So that's speculation, don't know if it actually happened, but there's bells, and then there's pomegranates on the hem of the robe, too. It's another connection to Eden. The future temple in Israel will have carvings of pomegranates to make this connection the fruitful abundance of Eden, right on the clothing itself there. The breast piece has 12 stones embedded into it. These are four rows of three. Each stone has the name of one of the tribes of Israel on it. So this was symbolic. It represented the priest carrying the people of Israel into God's presence on his heart. The priest is symbolically representing Israel. So all of Israel can't go in, but the priest can, and he represents them stands in place of them. So as the priest goes in, it's like all of God's people going in. So we are out of Eden, but one person can get in, representing the rest of God's people. And then he had a turban, and it had a golden plate across his forehead like a crown, and it said, holy to Yahweh, holy to the Lord. This may be another royal kingly feature as well. So all of this shows that the high priest is really serving like a new Adam, new Adam and Eve, new humanity here. He's washed, he's clothed with beauty, he represents God's people, and as he enters into God's presence, it's a picture of Adam and Eve and sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, those who are God's people, returning to Eden in God's presence. The third step is anointing. This is verses 10 to 13. Then Moses took the anointing oil by olive oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it, and he consecrated them. And he sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times, and he anointed the altar and all its utensils and the basin and its stands to consecrate them. He poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. And Moses brought Aaron's sons and clothed them with coats and tied sashes around their waists and bound caps on them as the Lord commanded Moses." So Moses is anointing both the tabernacle and everything in it and the priests here. So anointed with oil, and then the, the oil is poured on Aaron's head to anoint him as well. 
So olive oil was often used as a way of identifying and setting apart people for special service to God. It's what holiness refers to, being set apart and devoted to God. And so everything in the tabernacle, it's not been used yet. The tabernacle's set up, but there's, there have not been offerings, there's not been priests working yet. And so before that happens, everything is consecrated, anointed with oil, set apart for special service. The fourth and fifth steps are the sin and burnt offerings. So they brought a bull. The priests would press their hands down on it, and then they killed it as a substitute for them. Over and over, the offerings say, through this visible way, that these people and these priests themselves don't deserve to be in God's presence. And if you go in, it's like re-entering Eden, consequences death. But an unblemished animal standing in the place of the blemished people can be offered in their place. And so that's what's happening here. And then the blood was used uh, not just as a mark of forgiveness, it's actually a cleansing agent, like a spiritual bleach. And so it's cleansing the altar, purifying it spiritually. The sixth step is the ordaining of the priest. So this is verses 22 to 24. It's peculiar at first. Then he presented the other ram, the ram of ordination, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram, and he killed it. And Moses took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. Then he presented Aaron's sons, and Moses put some of the blood on the lobes of their right ears, on the thumbs of their right hands, and on the big toes of their right feet. And Moses threw the blood against the sides of the altar. So he's taking the blood and putting it on the right ear, the right thumb, the right big toe. What is that about? Well, it's probably a way of symbolically purifying and setting apart the entirety of this person, right? Head to toe for God and cleansing. In particular, each of these three body parts communicates something important. The ear for hearing and doing God's Word. One of the main roles of the priests was to know God's Word and teach God's people. We don't often think about that as as a priest's role, but one of their primary roles was to teach God's Word to God's people. In the Old Testament, hearing is not just about listening but doing. It's internalizing God's Word. So Adam heard God's commands but didn't do him do them. And now it's saying this new Adam, this new high priest, these priests need to hear and internalize and do God's word. The hand is about doing God's work and doing his word. The priests were to use their hands to offer sacrifices, purify the um, to purify the tabernacle, so their hands need to be purified. Their feet It's about going. The priests will walk around the sacred ground. It needs to be purified. So like Moses. We don't read anything about the priests having sandals. Seems like they were barefooted, walking on holy ground like Moses before the burning bush. And so their feet need to be not only washed with water, but spiritually purified as they walk on holy ground. They're set apart from God ear to toe. Final step is the seventh step, and this introduces their creation week. Verse 33, and you shall not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting for seven days until the days of your ordination are completed, for it will take seven days to ordain you. As has been done today, the Lord has commanded to be done to make atonement for you. At the entrance of the tent of meeting, you shall remain day and night for seven days, performing what the Lord has charged, so that you do not die, for so I've been commanded. So they've now been ordained over the course of seven steps, and then the seventh step is to stay at the entrance of the tent for seven days and nights. I mean, they're, they're all day, all night, all week there. And that's all tied to creation again. The high priest is viewed as this new Adam, this new humanity being created here. And the priests are now cleansed and purified to serve in this symbol-laden Edenic tabernacle. And before everything launches, there's a creation week, seven days. And they have offerings all through these days. This is, this is a drama that's portraying the restart, the relaunching of this mini Eden. The priests are in some ways actors playing a role, enacting a drama before Israel, picturing how humanity can return to God, ultimately pointing forward to Jesus. 
The tabernacle is God's royal palace. The priests are like the house servants in God's royal palace. Everything is prepared for God to come and dwell with His people. So now, after this creation week, God causes His glory to appear. So this is the second point here, the next chapter, chapter 9, God makes His glory appear. This is now the launch of the whole tabernacle system. Verse 1 picks up the story on the eighth day. So the creation week's over. It's now the eighth day, which is the first day of a new week. It's the beginning of the new creation for Israel. A new era is starting in their history. For the first time, we now have this new Eden and new Adam pictured in front of them, and God's glory is about to appear. The glory that was lost in the beginning. The first section says to bring all the offerings. And then the goal of those offerings and the goal of all of this is in verse 6 of chapter 9. And Moses said, This is the thing that the Lord commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. So that's the purpose of the tabernacle. When God first told Moses to build it, this was the reason he gave. In Exodus 25, he said, build this thing, why? So that I will dwell with my people. That's the main point. The purpose of the tabernacle is the same purpose of creation. It's the same purpose for why we were made at the heart of creation in the beginning was life with God, enjoying God's presence, walking with God in friendship. Most of the chapter then is an overview of the offerings that are given to launch this day. The offerings, uh, there's, there's nothing really new here that we haven't seen in previous weeks if you've been with us. They picture the people's acceptance before God, their devotion to God, their fellowship with God as they eat the meal of the peace offering. So I won't go into detail this morning because we've done that for a few weeks here, but that's the point. Acceptance by God, devotion to God, fellowship with God. That's what all those offerings tied together mean. And so these offerings allowed then the priests to enter the tabernacle. They were accepted by God, devoted to, to God, and could enjoy fellowship with God. They could enter through the curtain to the holy place. And then once a year, the high priest could go into the most holy place. And they could do that without dying. So remember, Adam's kicked out of the garden to the east, and then there's cher a cherubim guarding the way back. And there's cherubim now stitched on the curtains in the east of the tabernacle, the only entrance. And now the priest, because the offerings are given, can go through those cherubim and enter without dying. So everything in these chapters is heading to the final paragraph. This is the culmination of the whole book of Leviticus so far. Starts in verse 22 can read it with me. Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he came down from, the, from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, which I'm sure it was a relief to people that they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. So the creation week's over for the priests, and now everything can start. The tabernacle is now open for use. They made the offerings. They entered God's home, his palace, this new Eden. The great solution to the problem for Israel is here. How can the holy God dwell among sinful people? How can anyone re-enter God's presence? The answer is through the sacrifices and through the priests. After Moses and Aaron enter, they came out and they blessed the people. Amazing. So they give them a benediction or a blessing. Benedictions are speaking God's promises over God's people as expected blessings because God has promised good things for His people who take refuge through the sacrifices and the priests. And they, so they pronounce these blessings. The Lord bless you and keep you and make His face shine upon you and give you peace. And this is all God's idea. And think of this in light of the beginning of the story in Genesis. Adam and Eve 
lost the fullness of this blessing because of sin, and they're sent out, and the ground is cursed because of them. But now they're, they're not cursed. They're receiving a blessing from God. And nothing is here because of the brilliance of humanity's mind. Nothing is here because of the morality of humanity's living. They didn't, they didn't finally create a little subculture that's different and better than the rest of the world and say, we're really going to do it well. We're going to be God's people. We've got an idea. We think God will really like this. We're going to set up this tent. We'll have priests. We're going to do this really well. He'll probably come down. Oh my goodness, it worked. This is awesome. We're brilliant. It, this isn't the tone of this at all. We can't climb up to God. We can't impress Him. We can't get his attention and say, look at me, I'm, I'm good enough for you. No, the whole point of the offerings is to say, you aren't good enough. You have nothing to offer him in light of your sin. You forfeit life now and forever. Forfeit all of his blessings. But let these animals die in your place as pointers to Jesus. And he'll accept you by grace. And this blessing anticipates Jesus after he died giving himself as the sacrifice, fulfilling all of these sacrifices, the, the one to which all of them pointed forward to. He, he gives himself for us on the cross, and then he's buried, and then he's raised from the dead, and then he spends time with his disciples. And the last thing he did before he left, Luke twenty four fifty says this, lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Because that's what Jesus came to bring us. That's the point of the cross. Jesus is recapturing for us the blessing of God and giving it to us, not because of anything we've done, but because of who he is and what he's done for us. He is the burnt offering, the sin offering, the peace offering. He is the true priest. He opens the way, and He extends the blessing to all who will trust Him and have it. And now that Israel's blessed, God comes in His glory. He's come to be with them, and then a fire comes down to consume what was left of the offerings there. It was concrete evidence that God is pleased with them. He didn't send fire out to consume them. He sent it out to consume the offering, to say, I'm not going to consume you. I'm consuming this in your place and I'm here. They're accepted. And so they respond. They shout and fell on their faces. The shout's no doubt a shout of awe, but it also seems to be with joy. So there's a mix here of seriousness, relief, and joy. So a few implications from all of this. First, this all should lead us to cultivate a desire for God Himself. This is one of the most important events in Israel's history. It's the launch of this whole system of offerings and priests in the tabernacle. God is now with these sinful people, but not to destroy them, but to bless them all by grace as an outflow from His kind heart. It's a partial restoration of the life humanity lost in the beginning. It points forward ultimately to the day when a new creation will dawn. And there'll be nothing spiritually unclean, no sin, and no distance between God and all those who take refuge in Jesus. God's glory will be revealed forever. No threat of a consuming fire to consume His people. Blessing forever. It will be, again, Eden, but better. And we'll be there to enjoy His presence and blessing. And that's the point of this text, and it's the point of the Bible. It's the point of human history. We were made for this. You were made for this. Every person you've ever met and talked to was made for this, to be with God and His people. Jesus said that eternal life is knowing the Father and knowing Him. That's the heart of it all. So everyone was made for this. Some of you are searching for this, but you don't know it. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you're searching for it like all of us, and you're trying to find it in other ways. Maybe you're trying to find a sense of transcendence uh, through an experience or other experiences, or a sense of security and stability and relief, security through relationships. Maybe you're using relationships or a relationship to find that, or a sense that if you have success or respect 
then that will make you finally happy. And all your ambitions and longings and angst will be calmed. But one of the earliest Christian leaders named Augustine put it this way, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. So your restlessness is a signal to you. It's a signal that you aren't finding what you're looking for and you're not going to until you lock in to find it in God. So you were made for a sense of transcendence, which is why you long for it. You are made for security through a relationship. You were made for a sense of fulfillment and honor, but you'll only find that through God himself. He's the one we were made for. He's the one we can ultimately desire even if we don't know it. And for Christians, you may know all this stuff intellectually, but you can still find yourself sometimes searching for these things in these kinds of ways and dissatisfied, unfulfilled. You were made for God to see His glory, to see His beauty, to enjoy His presence, to enjoy His blessing and living with thankfulness for all that He is for you. And so this is why we as a church will always want to have and strive to have this triune God at the center of everything we do, because He's the point. We come and gather in His presence around Him to see His glory in Jesus, to be satisfied by Him, to find our longings fulfilled in Him. And so we want to learn to enjoy His presence. So an implication of this then is desire God, cultivate a desire for God. How do you cultivate a desire for God? There's a number of things you can do. Part of it is, is just getting alone and quiet, getting your phone away from you, and asking the Lord to help you draw near to Him and draw near to Him through Jesus and talk to Him. Thank, even thank Him just for the simple blessings, the fact that you're alive. And by virtue of Jesus, you have His favor. If you've never come to Him, come to Him through Jesus. Say, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. He died for my sins, and I receive that as a sacrifice for my sins. Please forgive me, and I receive this forgiveness. Thank you for accepting me. I repent of my sin, and I'll follow Jesus. Now help me by your Holy Spirit's power to do that. And for all of us, just reset um, through your days. Have a time every day to just turn everything else off and be alone with God. Um, open His Word. Hear His voice speak to you. If you don't do that, I know so many of you do this regularly every day throughout the day. If this isn't a pattern of yours, um, I don't know how else you cultivate a desire for God other than getting to know Him through the way He's revealed Himself through the Bible and then responding to Him in prayer and talking to Him. And then talk to someone else who knows God well. Ask them how they get to know Him and cultivate a desire for Him. Second, trust Jesus as your priest. Uh, this story shows that we all need a high priest. If any Israelite was without sin, perhaps they could have walked in to that tabernacle. But none of them could. They needed a high priest to go on their behalf. They needed the priest to carry them on their heart with those stones representing them going on their behalf. They needed this priest to sacrifice offerings on their behalf so that they could have the blessing. And the priest couldn't even just walk in there. They needed sacrifices for sin. So it's not like God told Moses, you all vote for like the most holy, godly, kind person among you. You're going to need the best one you got. And then he'll be able to do this. Aaron is the high priest here. Rewind a little bit back into Exodus. What's going on at the bottom of the mountain as Moses is at the top? Aaron's leading them into idolatry. Aaron needed a sacrifice for his sin, and so did his sons. So this whole thing is a humbling reality. Aaron wasn't chosen because of his godly character. He and his sons had to have sacrifices and for a whole week to prepare for them. Jesus came, though, with zero need for any offering for his sin or any cleansing. He came to be our offering. And if you think about Jesus' life, at his baptism, he was anointed. Right? The Holy Spirit 
came down on him. He was anointed, and that was part of this anointing for his ministry, even as a priest. Priests were installed at about their 30th year. So that's about what Jesus was, I'm saying about, it's true, 30. Um, and he's anointed then for his priestly work. And then he goes through his ministry as a priest, teaching people God's word, cleansing people of their sin. And then he offers himself on the cross as the, the fulfillment of all the sacrifices, putting an end to all of it. The true burnt offering, the true sin offering, the true guilt offering, the true peace offering. So he's the priest who goes before us to the presence of the Father, and he carries us on his heart. If you come to the Father through Jesus, you are on Jesus' heart, and he carries you into God's presence, and he always will. You never enter into God's presence apart from Jesus. In fact, this is one of the reasons why we pray in Jesus' name. Right? Where part of that is saying, Father, I'm coming to you not on my own authority or my own goodness, but in Jesus' name. And I can come to you boldly and confidently, knowing you hear me and love me, because I'm here through Jesus. He's my high priest. He's carrying me on his heart to your presence here. By the way, side note, this is why we don't, uh, if you're praying to the Father, you don't pray in your name. I th- it's become this trend. Um, so, a little minor correction here. It's theologically and practically important. If you're praying to the Father, you don't end that prayer in your name because we don't pray in the name of the Father. We pray to the Father in the name of the Son, Jesus. So we say, Father, in Jesus' name. And the reason why it's important is because we should mean something when we're saying that. What would we mean if we're saying in your name? We're saying in Jesus' name because we're acknowledging, I need a Savior, I need a priest, I need a sacrifice, and I have one. And that's why I can come before you. Thank you, Father. I come in Jesus' name and in the Spirit uh, for you. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 says this, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So let's draw near to the Father through Jesus, praying in Jesus' name. Third, let's respond uh, to all of this and to Christ with reverence and joy. That's how the Israelites respond here to seeing God's glory and seeing the fire. They had both reverence and joy, and that fire is threatening. Next Sunday, chapter 10, if chapters 8 and 9 are kind of a Genesis 2 creation narrative, chapter 10 is Genesis 3 all over again immediately, and that fire is going to come out and do something different than consume the offering. So, it is a fearful thing to be in the hands of God apart from a reverent trust in Jesus. And so the only fitting response is this kind of shout with joy, this reverence that's not stale and stuffy and unemotional and not a joy that's cheap and uh, vapid and frothy, but deep reverence and deep joy. So that's what we should cultivate before the Lord in prayer and aware of His presence here on Sundays. We live in His presence through our week with that kind of tone. And then finally, uh, we live as a priest. This isn't the, the main implication of this text, but it is one here because if you're trusting in Jesus as your high priest, you become a priest in Him. And this is really a restoration of your calling as a human being. Adam was viewed as a priest in the garden, Adam and Eve. And we've failed at this, and so God rescued Israel and called them a kingdom of priests, but they were still priests who needed a priest, a high priest. And so you have Aaron here appointed as their high priest. They're all failing, and they all will fail, but then Jesus came to really be the true Adam, the true Israel, the true high priest, fulfilling this calling perfectly. And as you trust in Him, you don't just have a high priest, you become a priest able to enter into God's presence and serve Him in the world as well. And so, you're restored to your very calling, which means we live our lives accepted by God, drawing near to God, and serving God, and then also making Him known to others. Let's pray together.
Our Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we're so grateful that we can come without being scared, but we can come confidently, boldly even, but also reverently and humbly to your presence. We can call you Father because you've adopted your people through Jesus as sons and daughters, and you love us deeply. You'll never leave us or forsake us. So we thank you for Jesus as our great high priest. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for doing what we all have, have no ability to do for ourselves. You have gone before us, and you are merciful and faithful and sympathetic and good. And so we thank you for being our high priest. So Father, we are grateful for forgiveness of sins and for acceptance in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.